wherever you are and whenever you are. Welcome, good souls, to Paranormal Now. This is Alan B. Smith. Join us as we traverse the cosmic highway of paranormal portals and tantalizing turnoffs. Tonight will be tantalizing indeed. Uh, we have our guest, Jim Willis, author and uh, ancient mysteries, ancient histories, metaphysical, spiritual researcher, um, <laughs> The checklist goes on, but we'll get to Jim in just a little bit. It'll be a really fascinating night tonight. I promise you that. Um, in the last half an hour, we will open up the Paranormal Radio app lines, and that number is 855-472-5483. That's 855-472-5483 for the Paranormal Radio app lines. And of course, we will be on standby. Bill, our producer, will get you on the air. So just wait for the cue and you can ask your questions to Jim or um, myself. So how is everyone doing? I I know um, I don't ask that often enough. And I'd like to hear from you all in the comment section. Please let us know how things are going for you. Um, we're seemingly in the home stretch of the um, the pandemic, which is it feels really good. That, that's the conversation that I'm getting um, a lot. And, you know, that's the small talk. Instead of the weather, how's the weather? It's um, how's the pandemic? Well, it's looking pretty good. So <laughs> we'll see how this this goes. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling positive, just like so many other people are. Um, but, you know, it's, it's still frustrating. You know, we're indoors more often than we would and the weather's getting nice and I want to get outside. Um, and for me, I've been struggling with with fitness since this whole thing started. You know, that's like my my way of getting centered. Um, I don't meditate as much as I as I used to or should. I don't exercise as much as I used to or should. So I'm really trying to to get refocused um, and get myself ready to to get back to full action, um, live action life. And uh, you know, funny enough, I know it's crazy, but all y'all from the '90s can appreciate this. Um, I've started doing a little bit of Tai Bo. And, and the reason I'm doing Taibo is because I found these free videos, you know, on YouTube. And so instead of paying a gym membership, which, you know, it, it's just too expensive for the time that you can actually get in the gym. Um, this has been my little cheat. So, you know, maybe if you're struggling, if you need to, a little uplifting in um, whether it's meditation, guided meditation or some physical fitness or whatever it is. I mean, man, we are so lucky that during this time this pandemic that we have the technology and the access that we have. Um, so I just want to continue to express my appreciation for that and my appreciation for you for hanging out live on these, on these shows every week. So, so thank you so much. Um, and of course you can follow me on show updates at paranormal underscore now on Twitter or at paranormal now on Instagram. So I'm going to bring our guest on tonight, Jim Willis, Jim, how are you? Yeah. Jim, it, it's it's great to have you on, and I, I think I'll let you share a little bit about your background um, because there's a wide variety of of topics that you cover. Um, you've been a professor, a minister. Um, what else? Oh, well, if if you can't do anything well, do a lot of things. You know, that's how it <laughs> works. I, uh, I I became an or or well, I, I was a musician uh, after I got out of school. I graduated from the Eastman School of the Music and was a professional musician. I was playing jazz on the weekends, and yeah. I was playing in the Syracuse Symphony for a while. I was a symphony trombonist. Uh, I was a, a choir director, so I've always been involved with conducting music and writing music and arranging music. And then mm -hmm. I. I was a, a, a school teacher, but uh, about uh, three years after I graduated from school, I had a a, a fundamentalist Christian conversion, mm. and uh, I went off to seminary, and I uh, finished seminary. I was ordained, and so for 40 years, I was a Christian minister. Well, <laughs> about 12 years ago, uh, it came time to retire. I reached the age of uh, 62. I'm going to be uh, going to be 75 next week, and uh, at age of 62, I could retire. I decided I was going to finally move out uh, to the woods, and I was I was going to go on retreat for one year. My wife and I moved out here to the woods of South Carolina, mm -hmm. uh, built a little house, and the idea was to confront the reality of what I had been preaching about. I've been preaching about God. And of course, this really switched. I went from a fundamentalist to an evangelical, to a liberal, charismatic. I, I covered the whole, the whole basis. But sure. I always had this idea that somehow 
uh, when you went to, a, you know, became a minister of a church, you were going to be involved in this spiritual community that was really interested in spiritual growth. And you were going to have this uh, seeking community around you. And it was going to be sure. wonderful. And I, I just, uh, I, I just loved the idea. But years go by and you realize you may be a minister, but it's a job like anything else. You're always worried about the next thing, the next church service, uh, the next seminar, the next speaking engagement. In my case, I was also a musician, so I was always thinking about the next music gig. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I kept playing jazz on the weekends and uh, kept doing a lot of com composition. And I was, of course, doing some part-time school work at the time. And uh, well, ja Jazz is spiritual in itself, isn't it? Oh, uh, jazz is the best best in you know uh practice you could have yeah. for real spiritual it involves not only uh knowing the fundamentals so well that you don't have to think about them anymore mm -hmm. and you're able to just use the background the chord progression background and then intermingle with other people and when it goes well it's fantastic uh, when you're talking to other people <laughs> except it, it can get you in trouble a little bit we we had a gig one night where uh, it was a, I was playing with a quintet, one of the best quintets I've ever played with, yeah. and uh, we were we were really cooking. I mean, the music was hot, it was tight, it was moving, and uh, we were just really excited about the whole thing. We finished this one particular tune. To this day, I don't even remember what tune it was. One of the uh, American Songbook jazz standards, but we finished it, and it just wound up tight. And uh, I remember saying to the sax player, the tenor sax player next to me, I said, "Man, that was that was great," and the sax player looked at me. And he says, yeah, best thing in the world, better than sex, except the only trouble was his life, his mic was still live and his, <laughs> wife, his wife was sitting in the front row. And that didn't go over too well at that time. But yeah, yeah, jazz, jazz is, uh, is just, uh, it, it becomes a part of you. And, and it's yeah. the idea of, well, again, uh, you know, the you're, musicians you're, out there will know you. You you come to know the background so well. You you know the the scales. You know the arpeggios. You've practiced. You, you don't think it anymore. You're just going, and there can't be any better training for real spirituality. Especially uh, when I came out here to the woods and I wanted to confront that reality that I had been preaching about my whole life. I've been preaching about God, uh, about spirit, about spirituality. And when you're tied up with this world, this is a busy world we live in, man. I mean, sure. people are so busy doing their thing, and it's loud, and it's fast, and it's noisy. And you just don't have that same inherent spirituality that I think our ancestors had when they sat out around a fire at night and looked up and saw the sky and told yeah. stories rather than, uh, you know, getting so immersed in their cell phones or smartphones and watching television instead of, you know, they communed with each other and all this mm -hmm. kind of thing. So when we came out here, uh, I came out here with a real, with, with frankly, I, I had a, 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 a prayer. I had a Bible verse in mind. Uh, the Bible verse that was in my mind comes from the Old Testament, the Old Testament uh, book of Genesis. Uh, the story is uh, that Jacob and Esau were brothers and they got into this big spat and uh, they had a fight and Esau threatened Jacob's life. Jacob had to flee north. He wound up wound up in uh, in basically what is now Turkey and Anatolia, and uh, there he lived his life. And his brother Esau was running. But finally, it came time for them to be reconciled. And Jacob was coming back home again. Jacob was the nun, the one whose name was changed to Israel, and he became the the uh, father of the twelve tribes of Israel, the Jews today. Hmm. Well, he uh, he was uh, he knew he was going to meet his brother the next day, and so he was nervous and he didn't know how to handle it. And he was up like we all do when we're nervous. He was walking and pacing and everything, you know, wondering what was going to happen when he crossed the river the next day to meet his brother Jacob and meet his brother Esau. And the story is kind of crazy. It's in the Book of Genesis. It's Kind of a crazy story about how uh, all of a sudden uh, Jacob met this man, and so they began to wrestle. Why I don't know, but they <laughs> they 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 started to wrestle, and they wrestled all night. And somehow, uh, you know, of course, you have to read the story as an allegory. I think not as history, but um, as as they as the sun started to bring up over the horizon the next morning, uh, Jacob realized somehow that he was wrestling with God, and he said, "I will not let you go." until you bless me. And that was the verse 
that was in my mind. I came out here to the woods. I could have retired. I could have just, you know, done some supply preaching or some substitute teaching or something. But no, I, I came out here to the woods. I wanted to wrestle with God. And that was the that was the Bible verse in my mind. I will not let you go until you bless me. It was it was a prayer, really. We came out here to live in the woods for one year and wrestle with God. And uh that was twelve years ago. <laughs> and, are, are you still we're wrestling? Still, we're still we're we're still <laughs> wrestling, but I've 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 got to tell you a sequel to this story because a couple of years ago, sure, I got a uh, uh, email from some folks in Cornwall in the UK, mm-hmm. and they wanted me to come over to the UK. They they wanted to fly me over there, and so I could do a uh, uh, a talk, uh, a, a presentation, so to speak. I mean, in, in, in of an afternoon, about a three hour talk on uh, the birth of world religions and the similarities at the root of world religions. So I went over there, had a wonderful time, did some dowsing among the Mary Maidens and some of the old statues and saw Stonehenge and uh, Salisbury Cathedral. It was, it was great. But I had never been to England before. One place I had to go was a place where my ancestors used to preach. They were ministers in the uh, uh, the British church, you know, Church of England. And the church where they they preached was still standing in a little town called Fenny Compton. And uh, I couldn't resist. When I finished my presentation, I rented a car, learned to drive on the wrong side of the road, mm-hmm. drove up to, you know, UK, got up to Fenny Compton, stayed in a wonderful little bed and breakfast where they all recognized me as, a, as an American and I was treated like a king. Uh, the next day I met the town historian and she took me into the church and I was able to stand in the pulpit where my great, 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 I don't know how many greats, uh, grandfather used to uh-huh. preach. And when I was standing up there in that pulpit, I looked over and there on the sidewall were the uh, stained glass windows that were still there from where he yeah. used to preach. And one of the stained glass windows that you could only see from the pulpit was a stained glass uh, uh, rendition of Jacob wrestling with Esau, saying, I will not let you go until you bless me. Wrestling with God, rather, saying, I will not let you go until you bless me. I want to tell you, I had no idea that was there. I I don't know how my ancestors' spiritual DNA came down Mm -hmm. within me, but I went. the hair stood up on the back of my neck, as that was exactly the picture and the verse that I had when I came out here to the woods. Little did I know when I came out here that it was really going to happen. Uh, God answered my prayer, um, but it not in a way that I would have possibly seen it. I, I, I gained what I came here to do, but it wasn't through the metaphors of Christianity. It came through quite a different, uh, quite a different uh, medium that you might say that, that it really is more closer to uh, shamanism. Uh, and animism, uh, the natural religions of our ancient, ancient ancestors who used to live right here in this spot of ground, because it turns out we actually live on an ancient sacred place where people used to come. Uh, and we have found uh, all kinds of artifacts, arrowheads, spearheads, hoes, uh, stone artifacts and things like that. It turns out that we moved right onto a, uh, a a mine where they used to come and get the blanks that they needed to carve all of their, their special stones for the year, their, their tools for the year. And so here this, we are. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is right up your, your alley because um, yeah. one, you have this sort of spiritual synchronicity that's occurring. And then you find yourself in this historical uh, presence because you know, you've, you've done so much work and I, for me, I've always connected um, even if it's just traditional, um, you know, history, right? Whether it's ancient history, um, you know, 1500s or, and more modern, wherever you, you, you are most interested in, I think that there is a kind of seeking of oneself yeah. in the research of history and trying to understand it. Uh, is it too much to say that that's a spiritual act or, or what, how would you define that? Oh, I, I, I think it is a spiritual act. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I had a, I had a very good friend growing up whose uh, father died about two months before he was born in a tragic uh, car crash. And over the years he developed this uh, a story of who his father was. Cause he, of course he never met him. 
and uh, he, he'd got this story from friends and from stories that he picked up from family members and everything else. And and in, oh, oh, as, as the years went by, he had de- developed this whole idea of this picture of who his father was. Mm-hmm. Well, it turns out that uh, a couple of years ago, his mother was about to move away from the home where he was raised and where she had lived all of his life. And he went to help her move. So now he's an adult. He went up to the attic to help, you know, you know how it can be when you live in a house for 50 years and you go up to the attic, you know what you're going to find. Well, he was kicking around here and there and he found an old trunk. And when he opened it up, he discovered a series of journals that his father had written before he died. And it turns out that the father he had pictured in his mind was not at all like the man who was revealed in these journals. He finally got to know who his father was. Well, when I came here, I couldn't help but keep that story in my mind because I think we as a human race have put together this idea of who our ancestors were. And quite frankly, I think it's totally false. I think they were totally different than that. We didn't know who our father was. And now since I've come up here to the woods and held these artifacts in my hands and found myself quite by accident uh, being a left brain systematic theologian all my life, I did not believe in out-of-body travel and all this kind of stuff. But when it began to happen to me... Mm. um, all of a sudden, everything changed, and and I I found out who my father was from the the uh, the journals, the spiritual journals that he she had left behind. Uh, and I think the human race is like that. I think Graham Hancock said it so well when he says we're a race with amnesia. Mm-hmm. I've really come to believe that we don't know who our ancestors really were. And because of that, we don't know who we are. And it's our loss. It's a spiritual journey then to study this and and and, and find out who they were. Yeah, well, we do have folk tales. We have songs. We have writings by individuals yeah. um, some some in the you know more prolific than others especially like let's say you know since 1700s and forward right um, people yep. jur- tended to journal but that was such a very tiny percentage of the public yes um so you know we don't know how like the regular person really felt and how they spoke um yeah. you know chaucer is like the best we have you know going going that far back um, but before that, there, there's really not much. No. So what, what do you think that our, our, let's say, pre, you know, uh, 2,000 years ago? What, what were those people like? Oh, I'd, I'd like to go back even eight, 12,000 years ago. Sure. Uh, yeah. I think our, our civilization really began at, at Gobekli Tepe in, uh, in Western Anatolia. Um, next, I was, last September, I was supposed to lead a group over to Turkey and we were going to look at these ancient, ancient sites where our civilization really began. We couldn't do it because of the pandemic. So it was postponed till this September. Uh, still the company that's sponsoring it is saying, eh, we're, we better wait. So it's now pushed off until May of 2022. We're going to go back to Tepe. But when you go back there and, 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 and and you look at these ancient civilizations. Gobekli Tepe is probably the first temple, the first church, as it will, uh, that that was built that we know about. Mm-hmm. And they've only excavated about five percent of it. And the part that they've excavated is already much bigger than Stonehenge. Now look yeah. at ninety five percent more. Is going. What's that going to tell us? I I I really think that there was uh there's two lines of evidence i don't think you have to just depend on oh what people call woo woo or hocus pocus or imagining or visioning there are two lines of solid evidence that we ought to be studying and we're just beginning to the first line of evidence is what i like to call evidence in stone and that's Gobekli Tepe, and that's the pyramids, and that's the standing okay. stones, and that's Stonehenge, and it's the Mayan places and the the Peruvian places, and all those 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 people did fantastic things, and somehow we're asked to believe that just one morning these hunter gatherers got up and decided, hey, let's move some megaton boulders around, you know, and and <laughs> I, I just don't believe it. There's a whole chapter that's missing. So well, that how, uh, how, ev- evidence and so on, but but there's there, there's one more line of evidence, and you just made reference to it. I think I like to call it evidence and story, and that's oh, I was that's just going to ask you, yes, yeah. myth- mythology, because yeah. because we relate to that, right? We relate oh, to yeah. all those stories. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and, and it's, it's a mistake to think that, uh, these things just happen in the past. 
Uh, you know, there, there's a tradition that I like to call the Atlantis tradition. Uh, some people believe it's it's actually uh, a, a, a true story of an ancient civilization that that was destroyed. That's what I happen to believe myself after mm-hmm. my study. Some people believe it's just an allegory. But whatever whatever you look at it, um, boy, how do you get more relevant than this? Uh, Plato in the uh, Timaeus he said, for many generations. The Atlanteans, they obeyed the laws and loved the divine to which they were akin. They reckoned that qualities of character were far more important than their present prosperity. So they bore the burden of their wealth and possessions lightly and did not let their high standard of living intoxicate them or make them lose their self-control. Now listen to what he said about them. But when the divine element in them became weakened and their human traits became predominant, they ceased to be able to carry their prosperity with modern, with, with moderation and sure. they yeah. perished. Boy, if that isn't a sign of what we're going through today, it's the very yeah. same thing. We, we have ceased to, uh, as he said, carry our prosperity with moderation and our society mm-hmm. i think is is just really in trouble so i think it's really important f- to understand who we are we have to we have to understand this stuff we really do i think it can teach us maybe save us from ourselves i think you're right but i there is an optimistic side to that oh yeah because yeah. because you know uh, those of us who live in cities um we are now craving you know more open spaces getting closer yeah. to nature getting away from that that hectic life um and then there are other people who uh, are downsizing right so they're living in in tiny houses and that's yeah. been that that tre- has trending uh, has been going on for a good like 4 or 5 years yeah. and so I, I think there is an undercurrent um, of reaction to oh, to so. that, and I and that gives me hope that there's a, a balancing that's occurring. Yeah. Um, now every every society is is has a different structure, right? Mm-hmm. So can the structure for us a democracy, the U.S. you know constitution, can the structure be enough to protect us from ourselves? Wow, that's a great question, Helen. Um, I was talking to my daughter about this today. We were sitting on her back deck, just kind of. Sometimes when you do that in the woods back here, we I, we built our house for her right next door to us because she helps us out, mm-hmm. and uh, we have a back deck that sits over this place where you can look out into the woods and you just can't see anything. And it's, and we have some great conversations. And we were talking about this very subject this afternoon, and. I, I was I was talking about how the fact that the the world that I discovered when I moved out here, uh, the world of the spirit, the world that uh, dowsers know, but the world that people who have out of body experiences and near death experiences, the the landscape that they traverse, that's a landscape that has been uh, visited for thousands of years by shamans and gurus and mystics and and, sure. and rishis and everything else. But it's just been recently rediscovered within the last hundred years, and that's in the world of quantum physics. We've discovered this world down there, uh, and, and we're starting to talk regularly about the Akashic field and all this kind of thing. So here, the two worlds are coming together, uh, the world that has been intuited for thousands of years and the world that has been recently discovered through mathematics, the left brain, the right brain, for lack of a better way of putting it. They, yeah. they, they're, they've come together, and we're on the same highway right now. And so this is a pivotal time of human history. And I think I think one of three things is going to happen. Uh, when we were talking about this this afternoon, Jan and I, I had only had two possibilities. Either we're going to go the way of spirituality, or we're going to go the way of the materialism. And if we go the way of spirituality, uh, there's hope for us. Or we can go the way of the materialist and we can, we can perish. Jan came up with a third possibility. She said, you know, all these ancient civilizations that you're writing about, every time they went down, there was a group of people who saw what was happening. And they carried on the tradition. The Egyptians talk uh, of the Zeptepi, the time, the, the birth of Egypt, the beginning of Egypt, when the seven sages came to Egypt from their land, which had uh, been inundated by the sea and the, in the Western Ocean. And these seven sages tried to carry on the good 
of their civilization. And they, and they realized there had been mistakes, but they tried to carry on the good. So we were saying today, what if there is a group of us who is able to, even in the midst of all the materialism and all the technology and all of everything else, what if there is a group of us that is able to survive whatever temporary classic uh, cataclysm might come, even if we were to destroy ourselves with, let's picture the worst, a nuclear holocaust or a, a, a comet from space, which has happened before in the past and wiped out civilizations. Uh, uh, even if that worse were to happen, some of us would survive. And if we can keep the spirit alive, yeah, if, yeah. if, if we can, like shows like yours, if we can just talk about this stuff and, 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 and so when it comes, there will be uh, a group of people who will carry on the best of us. I think it's happened over in, in time and time again in our, in our history. And I'll bet it's going to happen to us too. Yeah. And we'll keep the spirit alive when we come back from the other side of this first great uh, break. Thank you, Jim. I've really enjoyed our conversation so much so far, and um, I'm looking forward to the rest of the hour and a half we have with you tonight. Thank you all for joining us. Um, this is Paranormal Now on KGRA Radio, live Sundays, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I will see you all on the inverted flip side. And we, yes, I promise we will get to ancient aliens. <laughs> Most wanted. KGRARadio.com. Welcome back to Paranormal Now. This is Alan B. Smith, your most grateful host. And taking us out of the break was music by Septembrio. That's Septembrio spelled with a Y dot com. If you'd like to go check out their music, they are available available wherever you download uh, your music. And uh, I have to be careful. Sometimes I'm singing along with the music. and I'm afraid we're going to come out of the break. Uh, blaring off key. Uh, anyway, so we're back with uh, Jim Willis. Jim, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Oh, great to be with you, Alan. Uh, so, you know, let's continue on with with the the ancient history and the the, the traditions that are sort of passed down, right, um, and kept alive, as you said. So, when when we think of that traditionally, we have written history of what what we know to be, but then there's the other side of history that is considered more speculative. Um, you know. What? Why are you drawn to an alternative view of of history, the, the building of ancient pyramids, and megaliths, and um, and culture? What was your first clue that that, that something was being missed? I, I I think I somehow always knew, but covered it up. You know how we can do that sometimes. Turn, uh, turning a blind eye. Yeah, we just turned a blind eye to it. Um, things, for for instance, when I was a, a, a fundamentalist minister, I uh, used to love Christmas. And uh, fundamentalism and evangelicalism doesn't have a whole lot of room for, for instance, the paranormal. Uh, because the paranormal, for instance, might talk about entities from another dimension who come over here and join with us. And that's that sounds too weird. So traditional Christianity says, ah, no, we don't do that. But then at Christmas time, we stand up and we sing, 
Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, or or angels we have heard on high. What are those songs about? They're songs about entities from another dimension coming over (laughs) here and sharing a message with us. Jim, you're making my... Yeah, you're making my argument for me because I because I always <laughs> because so often people criticize you know the paranormal right all these things yeah. that we're talking about and it's like wait a minute you know this this religious paradigm has all these fantastical elements all of it yeah all of it when when I go back and read the Old Testament now about the obvious things that everyone knows about like Ezekiel and uh, Elijah mm-hmm. going the fiery chariot you know chariots sure. of the gods yeah. and all that kind of stuff it's all there. What I didn't know at the time was, what I didn't put together at the time, was that Christianity is just one of the ancient traditions uh, that talks about these things. There, there's other a Hinduism, a Judaism, um, Muhammad talked about uh, an entity from another dimension that came over and dictated the Quran to him. His name was Gabriel. Gabriel also appears in the Jewish scriptures. He appeared to Daniel and gave him a message about the end times. He appears in the New Testament scriptures. This this common entity from another dimension who steps through into our dimension. Uh, It's all there. And I think we've developed a bad habit, an intellectual habit. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's that we, I mean, I, I, I revere science. I revere scientists and what they've done. Don't get me wrong. Nothing wrong with that at all. Sure. Yeah. But our whole scientific method is involved in measuring and in observing and in describing things that happen within this perception realm, within the realms that are here to our, our own senses. And our perception realm is a very, very narrow band. Mm-hmm. Uh, even the Look at light, for instance. We know there's light way that we, below where we can see and way above. Sound. I mean, I go out in the woods with my dog. My dog can hear things that I can't hear. Yeah. Uh, we we know that our perception realm is a very limited perception. But all of our science is dedicated around seeing those things which are within our perception realm, and that's what we call reality. Right. And I think the truth is it may be our reality, it may be the reality we live in, but quantum physics has taught us beyond a shadow of a doubt that the reality that we live in is only a very small percentage of the total reality that we're simply not aware of. Yeah. Uh, well, there's a difference, right? Because quantum physics or physics have, have proven that, you know, life, life is just mysterious, right? There, yeah. There's like the light itself is actually understandable to a degree, whereas before it was just this you know, a magical thing. Yeah. Um, we can measure parts of the universe and then there's theoretical physics that, you know, you know, essentially speculates uh, based, based on math that there are literally multiple universes. Like there could yep. be multiple realities, not just different wavelengths that we don't see with our, and feel with our five senses. Yep. Yep. Um, now uh, we had a guest recently and she was saying that uh, one could slip between uh, different realities. Yes. And do you do you subscribe to that? Do you think that in this moment, like everybody listening right now, you and I, that any one of us could slip into a different parallel reality and have no idea that it actually happened? Yeah. yeah. Well, or, or even we could have an idea that it really happened. We could we could see it. Uh, since I came out here into the woods and started living all by myself, mm-hmm. uh, well, my, my wife and I, and then later my daughter came up, um, we spent a lot of time just totally alone. Uh, the days go by that we don't see or hear anybody. And uh, one of the things that I started to do when I got out here was meditation. And I was, lo and behold, so surprised one day yeah. when I when I had my first out-of-body experience. Uh, I hadn't expected it. I didn't even really know if I believed in it. Um, but when that happened, and then it happened again and again, and then I went up to uh, the uh, uh, Monroe Institute, and I studied with William uh, Buhlman for a while, who I consider one of the great teachers of -of out-of-body experiences Mm -hmm. and uh, spent a week up there with him uh, 24 hours a day, just going into this stuff and with other people. I, I, our, our senses are, are, are a wonderful thing. They've evolved to filter out some of the information that comes to us Uh, because if, 
if all the information in the universe continually came to us, we would just be totally wiped out. We wouldn't be able to handle it. So it filters it out. We can see only a certain narrow range of the light band, or we can hear only certain sounds. Mm-hmm. And we're only aware of certain things and certain feelings, but there's so much else. Um, and, and that's really what out-of-body travel is. I, I think a lot of us do it every night. We just don't realize that we call them dreams. Uh, when I was a minister, I had the, uh, the wonderful blessing uh, it, sound, it may sound morbid to some people, but it was a blessing of being absolutely uh, being in the hospital room, holding somebody's hand and 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 seeing them flatline, seeing them die. And then when that happened, of course, the nurses would come and the buzzers would go and the bells would go off and they'd push me out of the room and they would bring in the paddles and do all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, a couple of dozen times o- over the course of my ministry, my life in the last forty years, they brought the person back. And uh, every time that happened, I would be able to talk to them afterwards and say, did you see anything? You know, and I wasn't expecting anything like that. I didn't really believe in that kind of stuff. And they would tell me stories about seeing a light and seeing the tunnel and seeing a presence where sometimes they might say it was Jesus or they might say it was Moses or they might say it was just a bright light or they might say it was a, a figure of light. And, and and they would tell me these stories or sometimes it was Uncle Joe, you know, who died a couple of years ago, that kind of thing. I'm kicking myself right now because, I mean, although I never said, oh, come on, no, it's just your brain is shutting down and the blood is not going through your brain, all this kind of stuff. I never said that, of course, but that's basically what I was thinking. Now I'm wondering if I had been open, if I had taken the, gotten rid of the ego and the hubris, and really listened to these people and heard what they had to say. Yeah. Now I can recall it in vivid detail. I think I would have learned so much from these people. Sure. And when I had my first out-of-body experience, and I would come back and try to explain. Of course, if you write books, if you're an author, the trouble that's the trouble. You're going to a place that's beyond language. Language was invented to describe things within this perception realm. Yeah. Yeah. So now you go out of this perception realm, and all of a sudden – your your body is in effect asleep, but your mind is fully awake. And you're seeing things that you've never seen before. You're experiencing things. You're getting teachings that are coming down to you into these big blocks of teachings that are just coming, not verbal, uh, the hard way, way we do it. Yeah. And, and it's so real and it's so vivid. And since then, I've talked to literally hundreds of people who have had out-of-body experiences and I've read even more and they all say the same thing. It's more real there than it is here. The trouble is when you come back here, especially if you're a writer, or if you want to tell somebody about it, you've got to use language. <laughs> and so it doesn't work. The language mm. falls Sure. You you can't say this is what it was. All you can say is this is what it was like. Sure, sure. And so you come up with all these fantastic descriptions of hybrid creatures with birds' heads and wings, but human yeah. bodies. And it, it, it's not that that's actually what it was. It's just that's the closest you can come to describe it. Well, I think and, that that's a good point. It's kind of like when you, even just a dream, right? Sometimes you wake oh, up from yeah, a dream yeah. and you try to explain the dream to somebody. Um, you know, there's an an abstract element to it, so it's hard to really put, you know, uh, words and you know in a way that describes it accurately. But it does. It seems like on the evolutionary scale that verbal auditory language is um, not the highest level, right? Like there, there's room because obviously light at the speed of light is faster than the speed of sound. So that's a more efficient way of communication. If if we could use, um, you know, brain waves or energy waves that yeah. would communicate in that way. And then you would get more details without having to take the time to structure something together. And I, I remember Terrence Mc. Kenna would speak about this. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but yes, yes. Um, he was, yeah. Okay. So he was a bit of a psychedelic um, explorer and, you know, he would describe these encounters when he was on uh, dimethyltryptamine with these like elf like beings. And they would kind of communicate with him using what like these jeweled kind mm-hmm. of things that would just kind of like bounce or move towards him. And it's like, he knows that they're trying to speak to him. He just doesn't understand it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so all these alternate um states of mind people come back from those with 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 
similar, maybe not exact, but similar experiences where it's the intangible. And yet, like you said, it feels more real. Yeah. 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 How do you, I mean, and we've invented poetry and music, for instance, to try to say something that words just don't make, yeah, you know, yeah. words don't do. Uh, I studied uh, Johann Sebastian Bach when I was in school we, for two years. We just studied the music of Bach and I learned all the rules and everything else. And I followed all of his rules. My music still didn't sound like his, but when, when I listen to music today, mm-hmm. Uh, I can tell you how it's put together. I can tell you why. I can tell you the chord changes. I can tell you how this goes there and the rule certain rule and all this kind of, I can tell you all that stuff, but I can't tell you why it's beautiful. You know, I, I, I it, it, it touches us deeper than language. I think, I know for a writer, this is a terrible thing to say, but I, mm-hmm. I think probably words are one of the most primitive ways of communicating in the, in, in the cosmos. I really do. Uh, I think there's much better ways, much more efficient ways to do it, but we can't do them as long as we're in this left brain culture that we're in so much. When people have encounters with extraterrestrials, they often describe a tele, you know, telepathic communication mm-hmm. um but often it's described in terms of of imagery right not not a language per se that they're receiving in their in their mind yeah. uh, have have you heard of this and uh well i guess two part question one do you think extraterrestrials are visiting earth um and two how much of these stories that you hear of close encounters of the fourth and, and or fifth kind, yep. which seems to be trending yep. right now? Let me let me throw out a challenge to your listeners right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're going to open up the phone lines at the end of this time together. Mm-hmm. I'll I will almost be willing to guarantee that there will be somebody who will tell us who can call us or tell us that they've had an experience like this. And the only way they can describe what they learned was that it came in what I call and what many people have called a block of teaching. It doesn't yeah. come word, 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 sentence, 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 paragraph. It's a block of teaching that's suddenly right there. Yeah. I'll be willing to bet you that there's someone listening right now who can call us at the end of this broadcast and and tell us they've had that same thing because it's happened over and over and over to me. So I yeah. guess by saying that, that answers the first part of the question. Do I believe they're there? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that uh, when we're talking about alien entities and that kind of thing, we're talking about two mm-hmm. separate experiences. Number one, I think the universe is full of life. And uh, I, I don't, have any problem thinking that there have been uh, actual nuts and bolts spaceships that come out and are still coming out people yeah. visiting us within this universe uh, i have no problem with that at all i mean i <laughs> when you own, just look at our own experience as well, you have as 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 soon as we could get a get a, a a probe out in space the first thing we did was send it out to go out of our out of our galaxy, I mean, out mm-hmm. out of our particular solar system, and and go out there, and you know, Carl Sagan put the golden record in it, and the pictures of the man and the mm-hmm. woman, and all. And what were we doing? The first, as soon as we could get off the planet, the first thing we did was say, "Hey, we're here." You know, here's our here's. Our, you can't tell me that other other civilizations would done the same thing. So I, I I really believe that's one thing that that yes we have been visited and are being visited. I I have no problem with that whatsoever. Well, you, well, you say you have no problem with it. So does, what does that mean? You accept the possibility, or do you oh. accept that it's actually happening? Oh, I think it's actually happening. I really okay. do. Mm-hmm. And I, the only reason I can't say, you know, I haven't had a personal experience of that nature uh, with an actual entity mm-hmm. uh, in in that sense. So that's the only reason I can't say I've never experienced it, but I, 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 I accept it 100%. The so other, so but, ancient but, aliens then could very well have existed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think it's in the literature. I think it's in the mythology. I even think it's in the building structure. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't think there's any question about that. The yeah. other thing that I think, though, is is that there's other ways of contacting people, uh, contacting entities mm-hmm. that are not in our own particular cosmos because they come from other dimensions. Uh, Hugh Everett was the first one to give us the multiverse. And he paid the price for it. Oh, he was so persecuted in his life. Nobody accepted it. He was forced to one of the most brilliant physics 
guy and brains in the world that the world has ever seen, whoever. And he was blackballed from physics, couldn't get a job teaching, couldn't get a big, because he had this whole crazy, wacky idea of the multiverse. And so he had to get a job in government. And it was probably a good thing that he did because he was working in government. And his was the idea that probably saved us during the, uh, the cold war, the Cuban missile crisis, because he was the idea that came up with mutually assured destruction, which may have seen us through those, those tough years. But here, here's Hugh Everett. Now, all of a sudden, his ideas are mainstream. He's accepted all over the place. He's, he's seen for the brilliance he is. And what he was telling us was that we're not the only dimension. That there's a multiverse out there. There's universes right next to us, separated by such an infinitesimal degrees that all, all you can say is more vibration than anything else. And but, I, well, I can't help but believe that entities from that dimension try to come into our dimension and try to communicate with us. I know it's the case because I, in out-of-body experiences, I've got out of this dimension and got to, to see them. So if I can go see them, you know, why couldn't they return the favor and come and see me? Yeah, well, that, that's my question. So physics hasn't proven it yet, but you're, you're saying that there's other evidence that, yeah. that has proven it to you, that you yes. believe it. And so what is that collective evidence? Well, uh, of course, there's the obvious evidence of, of the mythology that we've talked about before. Yeah. Uh, the, the earliest, earliest texts we have right after the, our, our civilization invented writing. The first thing we started writing about was uh, visitors from other realms. Uh, we call them gods. Yeah. <laughs> we call them gods and goddesses. Uh, and of all know, of all the problems humans have, yeah, you know, we started talking about gods from yeah. Alpha yeah. elsewhere, right? <laughs> exactly. And and I think it goes back even farther. Uh, I think you, you can you can trace it back at least forty thousand years to the great painted caves of Western Europe, the shamans who lived back then, the wise men of that then. Probably we can speculate how it happened. We don't know for sure, but they may have uh, discovered mushrooms, for instance. They may have discovered some kind of other plants. Uh, probably not ayahuasca yet, because it, it, it took a while to develop that. But uh, are these 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 plants that opened up our minds, uh, opened up the channels of our minds that evolution has has closed, and they had these visions, and they didn't know how to communicate them, so they would crawl back under these caves, sometimes half a mile back underneath the mountains. Right. And yeah. and what they did was take these visions that they saw and they painted them on the cave walls. Why did they do that? If they were just simply trying to sub, you know be hunter gatherers and trying to subside mm -hmm. uh, sub, sub, subsist from one day to the other why did they take time time to do that evolutionary it makes no sense they were trying to communicate something and i think their communication was probably the first communication that we know about that showed that they were in touch with these with these other entities. And as I said earlier, every religion of the world is yeah. full of these kinds of stories. So I know I, I, I don't, I don't have any doubts at all that uh, it's much bigger. So you are still a, a person of faith, correct? Uh, yes. Yes. I still use the word Christian, although many Christians probably would not consider me a Christian, but mm -hmm. it's the place where I'm, I'm, I'm at home. I've been there for 40 years or almost 70, 75 yeah. years. And you and, seem well. You and, seem very familiar with the the psychedelic. Have you tried well, psychedelics at all? Or you know, I I never have. Uh, I don't have any problem with it. Uh, some mm -hmm. of my good friends have. I've never tried it. Um, sometimes I've been tempted. I wondered what you know maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. The only uh, uh, aids or crutch that I've ever used that I'm familiar with that works mm -hmm. for me is, is meditation. I do use Hemisync uh, tapes, de uh, a technology developed developed by Robert Monroe. Uh, to kind of, well, to make a long story short, uh, it, it kind of synchronizes the two hemispheres of your brain. Ah, okay. uh, and I do, I do use that because in this world, it's so hard to focus in just silence. Uh, and it's so hard to slow down. And it, it takes me probably a half hour of just listening to music and really working and really concentrating just to get to the point where I can begin to start meditating. Uh, and I'd like to say that it works every time. It doesn't. <laughs> um, my book, uh, uh, The Quantum Akashic Field, um, yeah, The Quantum Akashic Field, A Guide to Out-of-Body Experiences for the Astral Traveler, right? There it is. <laughs> um, it. Uh, I have a lot of my uh, uh, 
my out of body experience, my my journals are are in there. Uh, one one thing that I always recommend to people when I'm talking about if they have out of body experiences, keep a journal, write it down because you're going to forget it just like you forgot last night's dream. Uh, but you write it down, and uh, it can teach you so much. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I I I think we're at the beginning, so to speak. Uh, even though this has been practiced for thousands of years, I think we're at the beginning of our first real scientific structure. Because I think we make a mistake when we say paranormal is not scientific. When we say supernatural is not scientific, mm-hmm. um, I think it's all scientific. I, I, it, it all. There's science behind all of it. There's reality behind all of it. It's just science that we don't understand yet. You remember Arthur C. Clarke once said that uh, any magic, any technology that's far enough advanced is going to be considered magic. Yeah. Well, uh, that's what it is with us. I, I don't think the paranormal is uh, uh, is not scientific. I, I think it's just a science that we don't understand. And the same well, thing with the supernatural. I think there's also a sentiment of anything we can imagine we can be made possible. Um, But, you know, when I was younger and I was reading books um, like one or um, uh, Jonathan Livingston Stiegel, it gave me that sense that, you know what, maybe, maybe I really can tap into this force and, 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 you know, do amazing things, you know, and, and, you know, how, how true do you think that is? Like how supernatural can we actually get? Oh, oh, I think, I think it's, it's, uh, we don't know. We have, I think we used to be that way. We've forgotten. Uh, our, our, our civilization took a, a definite, we, we came to a crossroads back in, in Sumer in Babylonian. And, uh, we made a, a decision to follow the way of the left brain technology, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And the farther we went down that road, the farther we got away from the intuitive. I don't think there's any way of explaining some of the ancient megaliths that I've seen without trying to see them in the sense that there is a science, I call it a a psychic toolkit, that the old timers had that we don't. Um, Mm. We expect the only way they move those huge megalithic boulders, they must have done it with levers and pulleys because that's what we use. Sure. I I think they had a totally different technology. I I, I was, I was uh, in, in the visiting the, uh, the great uh, pyramid at Giza a Mm -hmm. number of years ago, a small group of us. And of course the Egyptologists, even back then uh, they, you know, they would tell you exactly when it was made and how it was made and all. And of course, most of those ways are now, They've now been debunked, but um, you can't go into one of those pyramids without having a guide unless you do it illegally, and we didn't want to do yeah. that. So we had, we had a guide taking us down. There was a small group of us, and we're we're walking in down through this 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 tunnel underneath the Great Pyramid of Egypt, and we're walking on this this boardwalk because they want us they don't want us to shuffle our feet and mess up the the the, the ground underneath it. And along the boardwalk is running all these wires, and the purpose of the wires was to bring light so that the lights would go on ahead of us without those lights. You can't see a thing down there. So I'm wondering, wait a minute, wait a minute. How did those people work down here? Uh, how did they build this thing? How, how did they work down there? They couldn't see. So I began to look for smoke or soot along the, the ceiling or the side thinking they had torches or something. Mm-hmm. No, nah, there was none of that. So we're going down. I asked, I was the first one in line. So I asked the Egyptologist, the guy who was ahead of me, I said, how did, how did these people see to work down here? The guy actually turned away from me and began to walk away. And as he walked away, he said, oh, they must have had some kind of a light source. That was his, <laughs> that was his explanation, some well, kind of a light source. Well, obviously they had a light source. They couldn't have seen to do anything down there if they didn't. What well, was he, it? Yeah. If anybody remembers the movie Legend from the eighties with uh, Tom Cruise, yes, and and uh, oh, I can't Jennifer Connelly, yes, um, yeah. they use them. They use the polished shields as like a, a light source, right? And yeah, reflect yeah. through. But you know that doesn't. That's not going to go the depths. No, of, no, it of, of what the pyramids are. Yeah, they uh, but, they they've tried that. It doesn't work. <laughs> it, it doesn't work, right? No. So okay, well, it's I mean it's a good idea, and we're creative 
people. So we are trying to, to crack that nut, but you think that, you know, maybe you, you, you have an alternative to that. And we'll find out more about that when we get back on the other side of this break. Thank you all for joining us tonight on Paranormal Now. This is Alan B. Smith on KGRA Radio Live. If you want to find out more about this program and others, go to KGRADB.com. All right. I will see you on the flip side. I try to capture our feel and tell you the truth But there's so much to be said So I just leave your small clues But now I'm burying my soul And the soul of soul Mainstream media's most wanted. KGRARadio.com. You lost in a bad way. Starting to let go. Gone too far the wrong way. Can take it all back now. You lost in a bad way. I've gotta let you go. Welcome back to Paranormal Now. This is Alan B. Smith. Thank you for hanging with us tonight. Taking us out of the break was music by Septembrio. If you want to find out more about them, please go check out septembrio.com. And yeah, so earlier Jim had mentioned stories of the afterlife or the contact with ETs. And if you do have a story that you want to tell... In the last 30 minutes, we will open up the Paranormal Radio app line, and that number is 855-472-5483 or 85-KGRA-LIVE. So call in in the last 30 minutes. We'll open up the phone lines, and our producer, Bill Skywatcher, will get you on. Um, He's one of the nicest and the best producers out there. And um, we look forward to hearing what you have to say and, and your fascinating story. Because I think most of us have had some some odd experience or contact in our lives. It's just that a lot of us don't talk about it um, live on YouTube or on on online radio. Uh, so, so Jim, you know, when did you get to the point where you felt comfortable talking about these kinds of subjects? Oh. You know, Alan, I'm not even sure. Um, I never used to be. When Before I retired, uh, I would have the occasional discussion or something. But mm-hmm. when I came out here, I just started to write books. And I said to myself, I want to write the books that I want to write. Uh, and I don't care if anybody's ever going to read them or not. And uh, it just uh, started to develop. And, and the more I began to meditate... The more I began to have these experiences myself, the more comfortable I felt about it. And I found myself saying, well, wait a minute. I, so many of us live our lives trying to please other folks. And as a result, we never find out who we are. And I didn't want that to happen to me. And uh, if I had an experience, I wanted to talk about it. And so I I would write a book and, and then somebody would call me up and they say, let's talk about it. And um, one thing led to another. I found myself talking to George Norrie at uh, two o'clock in the morning, uh, <laughs> on our our time, because he's out in California. And I'm sitting yep. out on the porch, and uh, it's it's pitch dark, and it's two o'clock in the morning, and I'm hearing these people call in live and and telling their stories. And uh, I found myself just having experience after experience. On my website, there is a contact page, and a lot of people will write into that contact page where they can write me an email and just to share their own stories. Uh, if, yeah. if any of your listeners want to do it, please uh, go to uh, www.jimwillis.net. And uh, it, it, 
has all the normal stuff about what's happening in, in, in my particular life. But in the end, there's a contact page and you can write me an email. I'd love to hear from you. I really would, because I think st- people are full of these stories. It's just that they don't get a chance to talk about them very much. Yeah, absolutely. Please feel free to, to call in tonight. Um, you're with the Paranormal Family here on Paranormal Now and on KGRA and with Jim. Um, you're in good company. So, Jim, uh, the, these structures... How much of them do you think were were built based on technology that's just lost, human technology, or technology that was given to us from extraterrestrials or ultra terrestrials? Uh, there's the big there's the big question, isn't it? Uh, mm-hmm. How did they do it? Uh, there's only two ways it could have happened. They either woke up one morning and took a quantum step leap forward and learned how to do all this stuff, or They inherited the wisdom from somebody else. Now, if they inherited it, where did it come from? Only two two places. It either came from off this world with uh, alien help, or it came from lost civilizations that had painstakingly developed these um, technologies of one way or another, and then were somehow destroyed, perhaps in a great cataclysm or something like that. Uh, Of course, the whole Younger Dryas Comet uh, idea is going on right now about how was Gobekli Tepe built right mm. after uh, that great Younger Dryas Comet uh, screeched through our atmosphere and, and devastated the whole north of, of uh, the whole north part of, of, of the Americas and all the way across into Siberia. Um, was there a Stone Age? I mean, was there was there a uh, an Ice Age civilization that existed that had? develop these kinds of technologies of mm-hmm. course the trouble is here here you go again you talk about these things and the scientists also where are the wires uh, where are the generators where well sure. that's yeah. our technology we think that an ancient civilization had to do things the same way we do and I just don't think they do. I think there's all kinds of possibilities out there. Uh, I've mentioned before about that psychic toolkit. Uh, I think they were probably capable of doing things even with their minds that we're not capable of doing. Although there's a lot of research going on right now that's opening this whole thing up. If you go out to uh, California and talk to, uh, to to Dean Radin at the Noetic mm-hmm. Institute, they're doing scientific peer-reviewed studies of uh, things like uh, astral projection or uh, being able to uh, see at a distance, you know, that kind of thing, or uh, moving uh, material objects like, you know, bending spoons and all that kind of stuff. And laboratory technicians, and they're just beginning it, and because they don't have the funding available that some of these other operations, can you imagine what the Noetic Institute could do if it had the same funding that the CERN project had, for instance, with that particle collider? Can you imagine what we could do? The trouble is, you don't find what you're not looking for. And in our particular scientific paradigm, we're not looking for this stuff. So we just assume it's not not possible. Jim, think about the $4 billion that was wasted on the particle accelerator that was unfinished in Texas. In Texas. Yes. I think it was the late 90s, right? Yeah. Um, if, that, oh. if that $4 billion could have just been given to noetic sciences or any paranormal ufological research, oh, center, oh my gosh, we'd be lightning years ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the pyramids, when we look at those, do they have any other function other than uh, a, a celebration of the greatness of the gods or what, what are oh, they? I, a, a simple answer is I'm sure they do. I don't know what it is. <laughs> There's lots of possibilities, but you just simply cannot build those things which are so mathematically uh, precise and so tough. I mean, I, I read ever since I wrote about ancient uh, uh, ancient civilizations and I wrote about my own experience with the pyramids, I've read so many ideas about, oh, everybody knows how they built them. They just did this or that. And that's all as, as if you could just get up one day and build a pyramid. Mm-hmm. That takes such a tremendous amount of work and such a tremendous amount of labor and such precision, such mathematical precision. And they're placed where they are for a reason. Uh, I think we've just forgotten what the reason is, but it's much too much to say, oh, let's build something pretty for the God. I mean, anybody can, you know, build something like that. No, these, these go far, far beyond beauty. Uh, they are you, beautiful. You but don't I, think I, it was 
just a jobs program? No, no, <laughs> I, I really don't. I, I, I think there was an actual function for it. And we find it in the mythology, but the mythology is not permitted in the scientific laboratory. We can't talk about mm-hmm. the, the, the mythology, but uh, there's just all kinds of, of uh, reasons, I think, that we could, you know, but the typical thing is, according to the Egyptologists, they are tombs and tombs only. That's what they're called. Never found a body in one, but they're tombs. Uh, why don't we find a body? Well, somebody must have robbed the body. How? Well, we don't know, but it must have happened because they're tombs and tombs only. You just mm-hmm. can't get past that. That's not scientific thinking. It's not logical. Uh, but that's the world well, we live in. Yeah, I think the way to best illustrate this kind of you know, unfortunate uh, closed-mindedness, I guess, in the scientific community, the a muamua object, right? And I've talked about oh, this on the show quite a bit. Yeah. Um, Avi Loeb, Harvard um, astrophysicist professor, uh, you know, he he's made an argument. He's put himself out there and said, any way we look at this thing, it, it just can't be natural. Um, and it seemed like he had the upper hand of the argument as of late. But then a couple of days ago, an article dropped and I saw people making YouTube videos about it saying, oh, no, we've explained it now. But mm-hmm. then when you keep reading, they're like, well, we can explain this aspect of it, right? Yeah. And the argument Avi was saying is like, you can come up with a theory to try to explain one aspect, but there are like five different aspects yeah. that don't, that when you add them up, it's literally impossible. On, on, mm-hmm. on their own, it could work. You can explain mm-hmm. away something, but together it's literally impossible. Now, yeah. is it literally impossible? I, I don't know, but that's the argument he's making. And yet the scientific community is still making I guess an ad hoc argument um, because they just can't accept that, you know, it's, it could be an extraterrestrial yeah. object, yeah. you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and it's the same thing with go back to the pyramids again, mm-hmm. when you actually go there and see those massive blocks, even if you say, yeah, we can build a ramp. Yeah. We can build hundreds of people in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We can get, you know, we can put down uh, water or something or, oil or some kind of grease on the thing and get them up there. Okay. Suppose you can build a ramp, even though there's no evidence of a ramp being built. Sure. Suppose you can get enough people. Suppose you can get the rock up there. Mm-hmm. Here are these massive rocks. And when you realize these rocks, you can't even fit a piece of paper in between them. Now, suppose you get the block mm-hmm. up there and you finally dump it off. You're still going to be like maybe what? Six inches even away from the next rock. You can't get enough people to stand around that rock to develop enough muscle power yeah. to wiggle that rock back and forth. There's not enough room to get enough hands on the rock to push it if if you've got to push it that last six inches. You just can't do it. And that seems perfectly logical when you're there, but you come up with all of these silly ideas yeah. that people come up with. And, and what gets me is human hubris again. Everybody who comes up with some of these ideas, they present it as if this is all they had to do. And all I can say is, yeah, well, you find a reason to get maybe a couple of hundred of your best friends together and build mm-hmm. a pyramid and keep them there, keep them motivated, keep them fed, keep them, you know, and, and give them all the materials they need to do it. And, uh, and what's going to motivate them? Yeah. What is going to keep them there doing it? Unless they have a good reason, there's Jim, just how, no reason for them to do it. How familiar are you with Machu Picchu? Uh, only from a distance. I've never been there myself, but that's uh, fascinating. I, and I, I've talked to a lot of people who have actually been there, and uh, I'm I'm flabbergasted every time I see the pictures of it. Well, you brought up the youngest uh, event, that catastrophe, a meteorite. How many mm-hmm. was that? About fifty thousand years ago, something like that. What the 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 younger Dryas? Yeah, oh, eleven thousand eight. Oh, well, twelve thousand years ago, roughly. Twelve thousand. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So did, and, did that precede then the the melting of the the ice for the ice age? Or well, at at twelve thousand years ago, the Earth was coming out of the last ice age. And the temperatures were were coming down. I mean, we're we're, we're rising really, and we were doing everything very nicely. It was all great. Uh, mm-hmm. The glaciers were starting to come back. We were starting to move out. Then, about twelve thousand years ago, uh, and and this is by no means a unanimous thing. There's a lot of people who were saying no, it wasn't a comet, but it. I'm I, the, all the evidence that I've seen so it probably says comet. A comet hit the Earth 
And the earth suddenly, almost overnight, went right back into another ice age that lasted for 1,800 years. Yeah. And about 11,800 years ago, 11,600 years ago, we began to move out of it again. We began to re- re- get e- equilibrium. And that was when the uh, glaciers began to melt. Uh, there was a huge uh, pulses in the North Atlantic as these great uh, ice, you know, uh, I, I, ice blocks would would calve off, and the uh, well, water levels rose all over the place, inundating a lot of of uh, ancient uh, archaeology that's right now underneath the ocean. You can find it in Egypt, you can find it in Indonesia, you can find it in Siberia. I mean, I mean off the coast of uh, in, in the Black Sea, for instance, you can find uh, no question about it. These places were there, and they were drowned. They're now underwater. So the, there was a tremendous rise, and that probably gave birth to a lot of the flood stories and all kind of. Certainly, that was, yeah. and that was precisely the time, uh, eleven thousand eight hundred years ago, that uh, that uh, Plato placed the, um, the story of Atlantis. He even came out and said exactly how many years ago it was, mm-hmm. based on his ancestor Solon and, and how long ago that happened. What the Egyptians believed. So it was it was a tremendous change in the earth. We haven't when recovered. That, when that meteorite exploded, um, what does that look like? Is it a flash of light? Does it reach well, thousands of miles? It was it was probably a comet, and uh, okay. it 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 was it was uh, a, probably a comet that was part of the same uh, belt that we go through. Uh, twice a year, John Denver wrote about it when he said he got his Rocky Mountain high and I saw it raining fire in the sky. When we go out and sit in the backyard and watch the the uh, the shooting stars and all that kind of stuff. Is it that, was probably that the, a, the Perseids? But, yeah, that's right. Okay. And 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 uh it, it it's a it's a great cloud of, of that we go through twice a year. It's it, we're it's it's like a big donut and the earth goes through this donut once in the fall and once in the spring. And uh, it it goes through one side in the fall and another in the spring. And usually, what we see is just the little little things that hit our atmosphere and burn up because of the friction. Yeah. But probably the comet that hit then uh, that hit us back twelve thousand or eleven thousand eight hundred years ago probably segmented, and it probably hit in a series. At least four, maybe six of them hit right across the top of North America, yeah. put all kinds of geological uh, things in place. One big portion of it that landed probably right uh, in Saginaw Bay, the thumb of Michigan, uh, when, you, when you look at it, uh, right in there, it sp- just spewed these these uh, uh, ice rocks and, 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 and frozen rocks and up into the atmosphere. And they came crashing down here in, in South Carolina and formed what we call the Carolina Bays right in my hometown. Now, if that happened 11,800 years ago, there were people living here who saw that. And they had stories that they passed down about it. Uh, others, uh, other parts of this comet hit all the way across uh, Siberia, some in uh, uh, in Anatolia or what is present day Turkey, all mm-hmm. the way across Siberia. You can trace the this this thing. And it was just like, well, remember a number of years ago when we saw the comet that hit Jupiter and it segmented and mm-hmm. we could see the impacts here through our, our telescopes here. Sure. Yeah. It was probably something like that. Now, it didn't destroy all, all life on Earth, but it did destroy the, a great civilization that existed probably because this civilization existed on the waterfront, it was a seafaring civilization, and when the water level grows, grew, you know, grew and mm-hmm. and 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 rose so quickly, this civilization was pretty much destroyed. And so they would go out to these places. They would go out to Belbek in Lebanon, and they would go out to Anatolia and to Egypt and uh, to Mesopotamia. And I mean, and then they would they would go out probably the other way to uh, to Central America and to Peru, and uh, probably in an attempt to rebuild the civilization that had been destroyed. Now, I'm not saying this is a fantastic civilization with crystals and all this Wonder Woman stuff, you know, (laughs) but it was probably a a seafaring civilization that was uh, probably close to what was happening when Columbus discovered America. Is this Atlantis or Lemuria? I I think Atlantis probably was that 
maybe the home home base, uh, the the Washington D.C., the capital city of that particular civilization. And I think from following Plato's arguments, we can probably place it, uh, oh, in the the whole Bahama Cuban Caribbean chain, uh, which is now underwater. Um, so you don't think the Minoans were the Atlanteans? Uh, could very well have been. Uh, uh, I mean, okay. it, I probably all connected. I, a civilization is just usually not put in one place. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's put. I mean, and certainly it would have had an effect on that. Uh, I don't think the Minoans would have been the 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 central part of it uh, because uh, it doesn't seem to fit Plato's. Uh, directions. He puts us out into the Atlantic rather than in yeah. the Mediterranean, but it was could have very well been part of the same thing. So maybe the Azores or something like that. But yeah, then, yeah. like you said, it's a, if it's a seafaring, uh, we, we know that you know uh, people reached um, Europeans came over mm-hmm. to North America. We like sure. way before Columbus. Oh yeah, yeah. And 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 likely if if they were a seafaring people, you know, even lo- further back than we even realize. Oh um, yeah. And so what you're saying is, it, it's feasible. You think that an entire civilization was could be have been wiped out by this event. Yeah, yeah, and it left survivors, of course, but uh, those survivors were not able to, to. They could tell stories about what it was like. Think of it this way: if 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 this were to happen to the Earth today, mm-hmm. and it were to wipe out our infrastructure, and it were a, a, a big six mile wide comet or asteroid, say that uh, like the one that wiped out the dinosaurs when it landed in the Yucatan. If that were to hit today and totally wipe out our civilization, there's and some of us, let's say, survive, and we go down to places that we're not affected that much by. We go down to the rainforest. We go down to the Amazon. We go down into Africa, and we we tell the people uh, what it was like in this civilization. Now, you and I couldn't build an airplane because we don't have the technology. We don't have the stuff to do it, but we could tell the people about what an airplane was. Mm-hmm. And we could tell the people how it could fly. You and I couldn't build a television, but we could say, wow, there was a time in our civilization when we could sit and look at a box and see what was happening on the other side of the world. Yeah, yeah. Now, the strange thing is that in the Popol Vuh and in, in, in the, uh, the the Mayan uh, religious texts, it describes exactly this happening. The people who came and taught those people how to the arts of civilization, as they say, yeah, they said yeah. they could sit down and they could see what was happening all over the world. Uh, but yeah. how does, how does that disappear? Right. I mean, you're talking about wires, um, refined materials, you know, not, not necessarily. Uh, maybe there was, maybe there's a way to do it without all those things. I, I, I don't know, maybe without wires, maybe, like I say, it was a technology that we don't understand. And I, again, I'm just asking questions. Of course, we know sure. we, and the scientists are not there drives them nuts because they say we want more than that. We want evidence. But if you don't at least speculate about these things, then you can't start looking for it. And Jim, we I, have, we have a comment from uh, periscope and it says the earth is flat. Um, uh, what what's your take on on why people believe that and how, how do you respond to that? Um, I all I can say is you're welcome to your own beliefs, following your own evidence. Uh, the evidence that I've seen seems to convince me that the Earth is not flat, that mm-hmm. the Earth is round. Uh, I, I I I've seen too much evidence, but that's that's me, and I have my evidence based on the evidence on, 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 you know, me, my beliefs are based on evidence that I have looked at and made my own decisions and everybody has to come to that. Uh, yeah. Same, well, decision. there's, there's modern science, of course, but you, you've been studying ancient text, religion. So in the Bible for the longest time, the argument was the Bible says the earth is flat, but is that yeah. entirely true? Yeah. Yeah. The, um, Galileo had a hard time about this. Copernicus especially had a really hard time about this because the Bible says the earth rises, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Mm -hmm. And the Bible talks about the four corners of the earth. Therefore the earth must be flat. Uh, And that's what people thought. But but the Bible doesn't actually say it's flat. No, it just just says four corners and and that could be like directional cardinal directions. Yeah. Or it could just be metaphor too. We just don't know. Uh, Okay. Yeah. All right. So of all the, ancient societies that you have have looked at uh which one excites you the most is it Gobe- gobekli tepli 
Believe it or not, uh, the one that excites me most is the Yoman people of Japan. Uh, the Yoman people, the DNA of the Yoman people uh, comes from uh, people who lived for a long, long time around the Lake Baikal in Siberia mm -hmm. and then migrated south. But the same DNA is found about people who lived in the Lake Baikal area and then migrated east across the Siberian land bridge here to America. Mm -hmm. But the Yoman people who went south made their way down from Siberia, down along the coast, and, and settled in the area that is now Japan. We know for a fact that uh, that civilization existed for 160,000 years. We know how, do we know, how do we know for a fact? Well, because we can go back and find Yoman pottery, which is called corded pottery. And we find it, believe it or not, in South America. We, found it, we find it in California. Anchors off the coast of California. Uh, and we can go back and trace that DNA back and trace the people who lived back there. When the, when the earth, uh, the sea levels were much lower and there was building uh actual archaeological construction off the coast of off the coast of Japan and uh, they lived for about 160,000 years according to the archaeological evidence they didn't change that much mm -hmm. uh, the poetry the uh, pottery stayed the same the language pretty much stayed the same uh, there was not a warlike people we don't find a lot of weapons we find a lot of music uh, instruments and that kind of thing a civilization that can live for 160,000 years and not destroy itself because they are following peace. Finally, they finally went under. And what brought them under was the uh, a much more vociferous, a much uh, stronger uh, race of people came in and finally overturned the imagine uh, to overturn the civilization. But I like to ask myself the question if, and this is just speculative, did the Yoman people understand the wisdom of the word enough. Hmm. You know, we've only lived for 300 years and we're in the, I mean, here in this country and we're in danger of destroying all the, the ecological structure of this entire country. They lived 167,000 years, 160,000 years. And we have to have to ask ourselves, did they learn that? Well, enough is enough. Let's not overpopulate ourselves out of existence. Let's not burn all of our fossil fuels. Let's let's keep things the way they are. And this this corded pottery that can be actually dated. As a matter of fact, um, you can uh, carbon date it, and sometimes uh, you can actually find uh, enough evidence inside baked into the pottery itself to be able to see that they were already raising rice. There are rice grains that were baked into the pottery, which meant they had discovered agriculture back then. It's yeah. fantastic. Uh, how could a culture live that long unless they had discovered and the, the wisdom of that word enough? And maybe that could teach us something. Maybe we need to sit back and say, let's stop for a while. Enough, yeah. you know? Well, I don't know. I know that um, in Tibet, there was a period, I think, of about, was it 500 to 800 years of, of relative peace, right? Yeah. And, I, and I think it just takes a shared uh, system of belief Yep. But but not just a system of belief, and I, I think that that so much of our modern belief systems, or what are passed down from ancient you know, systems, are this is how you should live, mm -hmm. but they don't actually give you steps, um, direction, right? Like this this is how you can practice. This is how you can improve your mind. Yeah. Um, it's it's often be this, you know, be good to other people, yeah. uh, behave yeah. in this way, but if you are disturbed. How do you how do you get to that place? You know, you, you, that's why. Thankfully, now we have therapy and, and psychology. Um, but Buddhism has been on on that for quite a while, and yeah. and they got it that like if you want to be happy, it's not just you know um, like an Instagram right where we're posting all these you know quotations and and whatnot. It, it's about it's about practicing. Um, so, do you think that that's something that we're missing? And how do we? Well, if yes. so, how do we get it back? Yeah. Oh, I think so too. Uh, I was a music teacher for a long time and I was so disappointed, for instance, when math and science became the only way to go in school and music and art were, were put by the wayside. Uh, when people were saying that math and science, that takes us forward. Uh, forward to what? 
what do we have if we don't have music, if we don't have art? And I, I and I think it's the same thing with spiritual sure, yeah. principles. Uh, what would what would the world be like? What would our country be like if we could take our kids when they first go off to school and teach them how to meditate a little bit every day? And what would it be like if if people built this into their lives so that we get over this idea that you have to grow in order to if you you either grow or you die mm -hmm. um, bigger, better all the time. Stock market's got to continually go up. We got to manufacture more. Uh, gross mm -hmm. national product has got to go up. It's got to keep going, building, building, bigger, bigger all the time. And look what it's going to do to us. Oh, just uh, really something. Yeah, this is uh, from Bim Jim. He says, mm -hmm. Buddhism, when you walk, just walk. When you eat, just eat. Yes. And um, and it's true. One of the best meditations that that I've I've learned is when and, and you know the military actually does this um, when you walk s just count your step so left foot is one right foot is two and think about nothing else just one two one yeah. two yeah. one and you kind of feel that your mind just goes at ease because you're you're letting go of like all oh, that background noise yeah that that that, yeah. that chatter that follows you all day long yeah that that was where I've had my first meditating experience I'm, I'm a long distance bicycle rider or at least used to be a, i've mm -hmm. ridden across the country from california to the uh to the atlantic a couple of times and i've ridden from florida uh or from from florida up to new england and and I've done a lot of bicycle riding well bicycle riding is a pretty zen-like thing you're on the bike you got nothing in your mind you're going the motion of the pedals is just constant and it's going over and over and your mind can just kind of zero in and it's mm -hmm. a wonderful meditative technique um the first time i ever tried it deliberately i did it while washing the dishes um one day i decided i hated washing dishes and i decided i was going to try it so one day i i just i really took the time to take each dish and feel it and look at it and see what it was like. And it was a, a meditative experience that was back in 1970. Never done it since. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ashamed to say it. I've never done it since, but that's it was the, a wonderful meditative experience. That's the story of, of so many of us, right? Oh, uh, we kind of get started on these little kicks and it helps for a little while, but then, you know, you start feeling good. So you kind of slack off and then, yeah. you know, you, you forget about it. And then you're like, oh, I got to get back on that again. Um, but I think like this ancient Japanese civilization, uh, what were they called again? The Yoman. The Yoman. J-O-M-A-N. Maybe, you know, they had that holistic um, support system, you know, where, where everybody's doing this and working towards that so that your neighbor, your mom, your dad, your sister, your brother, yeah. your friends, they're all doing it. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're just constantly reminded like, hey, this is how you live. This is, yeah. this is balance. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, when you're living in a city or in an apartment, you're, you're, you're next to millions of people. And I love that connectivity, but it's a different kind of connectivity. It It, yeah. it doesn't really affect you at the deepest core of who you are you know yeah, um yeah. The, my deepest core is affected when i'm just hanging out on a porch and hearing the birds yeah. tweet and the breeze and the trees like that's that's living man you know yeah yeah and yeah. and it's and it's hard i that's why i came out here to the woods i i deliberately wanted to seek that kind of lifestyle because yeah I, i've found it at least for me other people can mm -hmm. do it they can meditate anywhere but at least for me, um, I have to get away and not just for a weekend, a retreat. I have to spend days before I'm into that slowing down mood, which is wonderful. And then it happens. And then I have to go to the store and I get in the car and it seems like everybody's driving so fast and it's so noisy and everybody. You know, <laughs> oh, man. Or I, I'll, I'll write a book, which can be a very meditative thing. Uh, um, some of my books are pretty, pretty big, you know, four or five page uh 500 pages and uh, I'll, I'll be so totally engrossed in it and then it's over and then i start talking about it i start going on a radio or i start doing podcasts mm -hmm. or television shows or whatever and uh, all of a sudden i'm right back into the world again i'm jazzed up about what's next what's the next one how are you gonna do it? And, yeah. oh i'm 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 a terrible example to follow sometimes. But you know the point is that that to find that thing or many things that work for you and integrate them into your life. I mean, I love driving, especially mm -hmm. at night. Put some music on and drive. It, it is so relaxing for me. All right. So if you want to find out more about Jim, please go to www.jimwillis.net. All his many books and works are there. And we're going to open up the Paranormal Radio app phone lines. So if you have a 
alternate reality experience. If you've had contact with extraterrestrials, um, dreams that just seemed utterly real, psychedelic experience, call in. That number is 855-472-5483. The Paranormal Radio app line, 85 kgra Alive. So, uh, Jim, you, you know, now that you're a little bit, you know, off the map, as as it were, <laughs> you know, do you do you miss though? You know, the 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 more concentrated moments where where people are hustling and bustling, or you know, in the city, you can just go down, walk down the street, and get pretty much anything you want, right? No, actually, to tell you the honest truth, it it it, it I, I find it very troubling now. Uh, I used to be involved, you know, as a minister, you're up in the pulpit every Sunday, you're talking to people, you got big crowds and everything else. And you're, you're, you're involved, you're doing committee meetings, you're always with other people. Mm. Um, I, yeah, I find it very troubling to do that now. Uh, maybe it's part of my life. I, I'm, I'm 75 years old. Maybe that has something to do with it too. I don't know, but well, I, now, I, you, now you can get your eyes on the sky more, right? And, oh yeah. And, and yeah. maybe you'll have one of those uh, close encounters. We've got our first uh, call from Jim from British Columbia. Welcome to Paranormal Now, Jim. Hello. Hello. Hey, Jim. Hello, Jim, Will- Hello, Jim Willis. Hello, Jim. How are you doing? Oh, great. I'm fabulous. Now, I'm on a parallel path to your own path, okay? Oh. I'm on a parallel path. Oh. Now, um, uh, I've been discovering a lot of new things. I'm 71. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not as good looking as you are. But oh. anyway. <laughs> now, Thank you. Here's, here, here's the deal, though, my friend. Uh, uh, I have chosen to approach this whole paranormal thing as Galileo approached physics, right? Mm-hmm. So what, Galileo was very empirical. He picked off uh, – he separated out a small part of physics, and he figured that out. And what he figured out first was motion. Motion is distance mm-hmm. divided by time, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. It's very empirical. So I'm I'm doing that with the paranormal, and one of these empirical things I've I've chosen to investigate is uh, mind to mind communication, mm-hmm. um, and uh, I've got some simple experiments in that. I've done probably thirty experiments in mind to mind communication, and. Uh, uh, you seem like the kind of person who could do this. I think you have the intuitive ability and power to do this. Um, one, one experiment goes like this. Okay. I sit down and relax and I, in a place where I can see groups of people walking around or like this was in the library foyer that I did this particular one. And there was a group of people became collected in the foyer. And I, I, powered up my mind and I thought at this, I projected a thought at this group of people and my thought was just an extremely cheerful hello. That's all. I just thought hello, but I thought it very loudly. And in this group stood up tall, spun around and looked directly into my eyes. Mm. This was a young woman who a uh, tall young woman who had this ability and she received my, my, uh, my message, my mind to mind communication, right? Now you could do this, uh, Jim Wells. You could do this and I think you have that ability. Now in some of my other ex- experiments, I got much better results. Like I have a friend who I can communicate with and, uh, I taught her some things and, and we did some experiments and, and it's totally real, man. Totally real. Now also the indigenous people. Yeah use mind to mind communication the 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 inuit people uh the what we used to call the eskimos uh it was as if they had radio communication back and forth with each other in their long winters that went on for six months of dark and they but they could communicate in their families they could communicate yeah. back yeah. and forth and and this was demonstrated i i read about this in a book written in the uh 1930s and I, I recommend in uh, I recommend reading these old books because they're not yes. correct. They're truthful. And, and they're the other thing. They're truthful. So, yeah. okay. Now, okay. Now, uh, you could do these experiments now. And anybody can try these experiments in mind-to-mind communication. I started out with the easiest one, which is uh, with wild animals. Mm-hmm. I do this with wild animals because 
you can see their change in behavior. It's very clear. However, if you try it with your pet animals, it, it's the, the change is not so clear. So I recommend that people uh, try mind-to-mind -mind communication with wild animals. Uh, I've done it with deer many, many times. Mm -hmm. Well, Jim, Jim Willis, have you had any kind of experience like this? Um, it's, it's much more common in the old timers than we like to give it credit for. One of the purposes of a shaman, uh, one of the things that shaman did was actually what they called sing the animals in, they would communicate mm -hmm. with them. And the idea of, uh, when you took an animal's life, you would then go and pray. You would actually be thanking the animal because yeah. the animal literally gave itself for you, for your yeah. life. Uh, and it was, it was very important. And I think there's solid physics behind this too. The whole idea of entanglement, um, the idea that everything is connected. Uh, you can take a particle here and a particle there on the other side of the universe. But if they were once entangled, you put a clockwise spin on one and the other one automatically right away, much faster than the speed of light, instantaneously, as a matter of fact, goes into a, 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 another spin in the other direction. They are entangled. And I think all of us in this way are entangled. And sometimes, uh, Jim, I think you're absolutely onto something here. When, when you see it demonstrated, uh, you all of a sudden realize it's not just a spiritual phenomenon. It, it is a physical phenomenon that we just are in the process of starting to understand. Uh, I, I, it's fantastic. I, I, I love that story. I really do. Yeah, Jim, thanks so much for the, the call. I, yeah, I had yes. a similar experience um, where I, I affected a plant and the plant moved. It was very strange. So this was not human. This was not an animal. Um, I was by myself, so I didn't have a witness, but I saw this happen. And it, you know, kind of freaked me out. Yeah. Well, one of the things I love to do when people come here to the house and I'm teaching them how to uh, start dowsing, um, we'll go to a tree, for instance, and we'll douse the aura of a tree. It usually comes out of a small little tree. Sometimes it comes out maybe six, eight feet, something like that. And uh, you you can douse it, and the, and when you walk toward the tree, you can when when you hit the aura of the tree, the dowsing rods in your hands will cross. Mm -hmm. Then you go up to that tree, and I've demonstrated this. As a matter of fact, you can see it demonstrated uh, on my YouTube channel. Uh, uh, my daughter and I have put out two channel two YouTube so far, uh, part one and part two on on dowsing for Earth energy, and we illustrate this on the second uh, dowsing video. You go up to the tree and you actually <laughs> hug the tree. You let it know that you care about it. You you and you know and 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 make a, 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 a contact with it, touching it, putting it right to your forehead. Then you go back again and you douse the aura of that tree again, and you'll sign sometimes that that aura has moved out fifteen feet or so. Uh, the tree has responded to you in a very real way a psychic way. And I, ever since I saw that, I have no doubt that when some people talk about you have green thumbs or sing to your plants, uh, or some people can, can, you know, do all kinds of wonderful things with plants and everything else. Yeah. I'm absolutely convinced it's true. I, 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 th I think it's at the basis of what we call prayer in Christianity and other religions. When you get a number of people together focused I don't think we're necessarily sending prayers up to a God who then decides whether to answer them or not. I think what we're doing is focusing our psychic energy and, and, and putting it toward a particular target. And uh, often you just see tremendous things happen. Yeah. Jim, thanks so much for the call. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. That's great. All right. So we're going to bring on Ron from Minnesota. Ron, you're on Paranormal Now. Ron, are you there? Hey, Alan. Hey, hey uh, how are you, Ron? I was uh, listening to YouTube. and listening to YouTube, so it kind of got crossed over there. <laughs> oh, thank you for the show tonight, Alan, and, and Jim Willis. A, a great, great, uh, great talk. And uh, Thank you, Ron. Thank you very much. I agree with 100% of what you're saying. I've experienced some, some uh, astral traveling, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, I've gone to other other worlds. I again, that's just, I don't know how to explain it. Yep. I can yep. just, just tell you I've been there. Yeah. Uh, I... uh, other places here on Earth that I don't understand. Uh, in my dreams or in my traveling, 
I can actually feel things that I have in my hand, like say a, a, a glass, for instance. If I pick up a glass in a dream, I'm actually mm -hmm. holding the glass. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm physically there in, in my mind. I'm, I'm really there in real time and everything. Yeah. Um, when I get back a lot of times from these trips, I'm usually sore. Like I've been digging a ditch all night, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I've had that, I've had that experience and I can't figure out why. But um, a thing that I've been working on, I've been working on doing the uh, fine tuning the astral traveling and visiting a uh, uh, friend's house and things like that. But I've been trying to work on fine tuning it because I have I have spirits in my house. Mm -hmm. okay? I, you might think, how do I know that? Well, I know that because I've seen them. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> not not so much in apparitions, but I've seen evidence of spiritual activity in my house. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I've, I've seen a 10 year old boy that runs around, plays, you know, taps me on my shoulder and I look and he's not, not there, but I know someone's there, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've, I've seen a boy peek around the corner of the way, you know. Mm -hmm. I, don't have, I don't have a child, I haven't, I haven't had any children, so no, nothing from me. But um, who knows what was here on, on the property before the house was here. But anyway, I have had two people remote view my house and they mm -hmm. have seen what I have seen. Mm -hmm. okay? So they, they verified what I was seeing and I'm not going crazy. No. Nope. And no, so my, my goal with the astral traveling is that I can get into that meditative state and that level and I can actually communicate with them and find out what's going on. Now there was one, I, I had one other woman that was here that actually went crossed over finally. But what was funny was I, I asked her to go and talk to the person that I'm working with, my 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 guide that I have, my spiritual guide that I'm working with, my, my mm -hmm. mentor, if you will. Um I, I said, Go talk to this go talk to this woman uh, and I told her where where she was and everything and sure enough she got a visit from the woman from my house. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then she was able to send her home wherever she had to go. But she didn't come back to the home here. She didn't come back yeah. to my home. So we, we got that part corrected as far as where she had to go. That's so good. there's some yeah. other people that are here, whether they're here because they're trapped here or they're here just because they're having fun, I don't know what the deal is. Um, yeah. I do believe they're here. I do believe they're, like you mentioned, there's a whole other universe that we can't see, mm -hmm. and it's right next to us. And mm -hmm. There might be a whole party going on. We're just missing out on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Ron, I have no doubt that uh, what you say is 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 absolute fact. I I've had four experiences myself of actually being able to uh, find someone who had died, and uh, were confused. Of course, time doesn't exist as we know it there, so they have no idea how long they've been there. Exactly. But uh, four different experiences of being able to actually meet with them over a period of several meetings and then helping them out of the, that world into the next. And uh, I say that with uh, with great difficulty because for 70 years of my life, I would have thought that was absolute nonsense. But I don't anymore because exactly. I, it's happened. It's happened to me. Exactly. Well, yeah. thank for a wonderful show, uh, just uh, just so amazing. Uh, so glad you're uh, been been trained in a lot of different things, but yet you believe on a you know, on a level that most of us can only imagine. You know, we don't well, really understand it. We just think, okay, well. <laughs> well, the fact that we can the fact that we can talk about it like this means that there's uh, you're you're not alone in this world, Ron. <laughs> we're we're here with you. All Absolutely. of us are together, and and we're multiplying, Ron. So thanks so much for the call. Okay, thanks, Ron. I really appreciate that. Uh, you, know, you know, it's it's funny. We had a we had an experience uh, just oh a couple of years ago where a neighbor came and and uh, wanted to talk to us. Her her daughter and uh, and her daughter's husband and their child came to their house middle of the night and they said, "Can we stay here? We can't stay in our house anymore." He said, "There was something going on over there that we just don't understand. It was too mm -hmm. raucous." And she said, can you go over there with your dowsing rods and see what you can find out? And I, I had never done this particular kind of thing before at that time. So we went over and we discovered uh, through just uh, through dowsing that this house actually exists on a place where two energy lines cross. 
And uh, we verified the story afterwards, but when we were doing it, we couldn't verify it in the historical record. But it turns out that uh, during the Jim Crow days uh, in here in the South, uh, a, a white woman had fallen in love with a black man. And that was, you couldn't do that back in those days. And the black man was lynched. And uh, he died, and she wound up uh, living in the rest of that, her rest of her life, uh, separated from her lover who had been lynched. And uh, she finally died. And it turns out that on this particular property, the two of them could now be together for the first time in these two intersections, in the vortex of these two intersections mm. of two Earth energy lines. And uh, so the neighbor had said, "Well, can you send them on?" And I, I actually asked. Him, do you want to go on? No, they didn't. They were finally together. They didn't want to go anywhere. I said, well, just don't make so much noise. You're scaring the kids. They said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and there hasn't been any problem since then. So, I, I never would have believed anything like that for the first 60, 70 years of my life. But uh, once you get involved with it, you begin to see it that it's not nearly as wild as people think. Do you know what? A lot of people seem to, especially people of faith, um, and in faith, I mean, you know, Christian, mm-hmm. um, are afraid of, of people who are psychics or, or mm-hmm. supernatural and they, and they claim it to be de- demonic. Yeah. Um, you know, having, you know, being a theologian essentially, um, what's your take on that? And why, why do you think that's true or not true? Um, no, I don't, I don't think it is d- demonic. As a matter of fact, uh, when I was writing my book, Supernatural Gods, I wrote, that I had never had a bad out of body experience ever, <laughs> and wouldn't you know it? After I finished that chapter, I had my first bad out of body experience. Oh, but wow. I don't think we take. I, I don't think we necessarily meet up with anything that we don't take with us, and that's the problem. Uh, we have to look within ourselves. When you start going into a landscape where you're experiencing a lot of fear, yeah. I think it's because you're bringing a lot of fear into that landscape. The words that I've heard from people who have been there and come back are wonderful words. They use words like love and compassion, acceptance, understanding. I think yeah. that's the basis of the universe. And um, the other stuff, the what we call demonic, I think is that that's what we bring into the picture and uh, we have to that's all the more important to look at ourselves and put our own house in order first yeah well it seems to me a lot of humans were endowed with abilities in the bible by Mm -hmm. by god right so if there are people now with that ability why not just think it's 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 from the source or or whatever you consider it to be yeah Um, i don't think that's hard to find And, and i think that I agree with you. It's fear, right? Fear. Mm-hmm. It's fear that that drives unhappiness. Yeah, it can drive yeah. anxiety, depression. Yeah. It, it is the demon, right? Yeah, and and there's a wonderful Bible verse that uh, in First John, first First John says so clearly: perfect love casts out fear. Mm. And what we have to do is look at our own self. I mean, all of us have a tremendous amount of baggage. The longer we've lived, and I think it's really important to bring that. In in the Christian tradition, we call it confession. Um, all, all confession is is I mean is is bringing up all that fear and all that stuff within you, yeah, and acknowledging it, uh, bringing it out into the open. And it's like taking a rock, you know, that you turn over a rock and there's all those bugs and stuff, the worms living underneath the rocks. Mm-hmm. As soon as a little light gets in there, they all flee. They can't stand the light. See, so yeah. if we can if we can live our lives in the light, uh, in 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 the light of love and compassion and all yeah. that stuff, oh, perfect love casts out fear. So stop suppressing that stuff and talk to somebody, right? That's well, yeah, talk, talk to somebody, or even even I don't think you have to confess to anybody, but just yourself, you know, yeah. acknowledge it, uh, say it out loud. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, say and 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 why not? I I know a lot of times, a lot of things in my life, I had to really deal with this uh, as as a minister. You stand up in the pulpit and you get all these people saying good things about you, you know, and they're oh, thank you for this, and thank you for that, and everything else. And then you begin to look at, oh, look at all the good I've done in my life. But then you say, well, why did I do that good? A lot of it was because I wanted people to shake my hand and say, oh, what a good boy am I? You know, that kind of thing. 
yes. so it was yeah. ego. Uh, and uh, it, it's a it's a balancing act all the way. You have to say, why am I really doing this? Am I really doing this out of a gen of, of of real love and compassion, or am I doing it because I want to be rewarded by other people for doing something that they're going to be calling love and compassion? Uh, right. yeah. it, it's it's tough. Yeah. And even when you have to just say something to get it off your chest, you know, be careful of who you're saying it to. Sure. Um, but either, like you said, either say it to to your higher power or to yourself or to someone that, that you trust. But it, that is important. It's and and that love thing. Right. It's it's universal. So yeah. it's it's loving yourself and loving others. You know, it's yeah. that it's that big love, as it were. Um, yeah. I have uh, I have to get this in. This is from Kathleen. I had a dream of aliens trying to take me. Uh, there were five of them, and I had beat them up, uh, and and said, "You are not taking me." Mm -hmm. uh, when we have, is that a dream? Do you think just a dream, uh, or do you think that when we have these kind of experiences, that there's something else going on there? Well, I think only Kathleen can can answer that. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think it's possible for us to imagine those things, but I also think it's those p possible for those things to actually happen. Sure, uh, and. Uh, uh, it, it raises an interesting point just because you can have a spiritual experience. Oh boy. I, you know, you can say, well, wait a minute, I'm in charge of this. They're not, you know, they don't have any right to come in here and take my life. If I don't want to, I can, I can say no. And uh, I've had that experience too. Just, just because an opportunity is there, you're still in charge. You don't give up anything. You don't give up control over your own um, soul. What the Hindus would call Atman. You don't give that up. Uh, yep. It, it's you have you have you are in control for a purpose. All right. So if you want to find out more about Jim and his books, please go to jimwillis.net. Hidden history, ancient aliens, and the suppressed origins of civilization, censoring God, the quantum akashic field, and so many more. And Jim, uh, thirty seconds. Can you tease your next book that we discussed earlier oh. that's coming out? <laughs> Yeah, my my uh, book is called Censoring God. It's about the books that didn't make the cut when the Bible was put together. And uh, it's a kind of an expose of the fact that when we like to think that God speaks to us through religious texts, there's usually a committee standing between us <laughs> and the original text who decides what we're going to say and uh, whether we're going to hear about it or not. And sometimes those committees make those decisions for good reasons, and sometimes they make them for political reasons or power reasons that are wrong. That book is coming out uh, April 1st. Well, I think the Paranormal Now committee listening tonight um, approves this message and has had a great time <laughs> with you, Jim. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. Uh, thank you, Alan. It's been great being with you. I really appreciated it. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Again, if you want to find out more about Jim, go to Jim Willis. Dot net. Um, and yeah, so we'll have to have Jim back on when his, his new book comes out. I'm really looking forward to that because that is a topic that kind of pops up right on occasion on the show. And I think we're all interested in all those other stories that in a sense we kind of missed out on. So join us whenever that is. But as usual, join us Sundays, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on KGRADB.com, your official contact for the best in alternative talk radio. And if you want to find out more about Paranormal Now, please visit me on Instagram at Paranormal Now. Tracy Austin is coming up next. And thanks to producer Bill Skywatcher and special thanks to KGRA head of operations, Eric Brager. Until next time, everyone, live in the mystery. 